What's up, guys? Welcome back to another daily Bible reading snapshot. Today, we're looking at Daniel 5 and 6 here in the Old Testament. And we are going to see the kingdom move not only from Nebuchadnezzar to his grandson, Belshazzar. We're also going to see the kingdom move from Babylon to Medo-Persia, which really the kingdom's not going to move. Just the people who are in charge of this place are going to change. So here in chapter 5, we see all that go down where it says this King Belshazzar was throwing a great feast, a great party. And he called, he said, I want all the ornaments. Uh, I want all the utensils. I want all the plates and cups. Let's bring them from the, the that temple we raided in Jerusalem. Let's pull all those out and we'll, we'll use those. And it says, as he's eating and drinking out of the cups and the plates from the house of the Lord, a finger shows up on the wall and starts writing something on the wall. There's some handwriting that's happening on the wall and it freaks them all out, right? Because it's like, what, what, what is that? And he's freaked out and it says the queen, which is probably the queen mother, um, says, hey, there was a person in the days of your father and grandfather who was able to interpret dreams and to tell these mysteries. His name is Belshazzar, Daniel. Let's call him. So the king says, hey, Daniel, come here. Um, I've got this assignment for you. Tell me what this is. I have no idea what it is. And if you're able to tell me, I'll give you tons of stuff and purple robes and all this stuff. And Daniel has a funny response. He says, I don't want your gifts. Just leave your gifts. Give them to somebody else. I will tell you what's going on, though. He says, the Most High God, he's the one that drove Nebuchadnezzar crazy. Why did he drive him crazy? Because he was proud. He needed to see that God sets whoever he wants as the king over the kingdom. And that's about to happen again. He says, because you have not humbled your heart. You haven't listened. You haven't obeyed God's word. You haven't listened. So it says the vessels of the house of the Lord that you brought out and you guys are all drinking from, God is going to judge you for all that. And he says the, the word here, the, the, the handwriting, all is meant to say, first of all, that God has numbered your days and he's brought them to an end, that you're weighed in the balances and you're found wanting, right? You're, you weighed you like with scales and you weren't what you should have been. And the kingdom is going to be divided among the Medes and the Persians. And it says, then Belshazzar gave the command to Daniel, gave him all the stuff that he promised. Obviously, Daniel didn't ask for that. And it says in verse 30, that very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king was killed. So the end of the kingdom of Babylon happens right here, this very night. And it says, Darius, the Mede, received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Wow. So all in one night, they go from being this feast and everything's going great in their, in their kingdom. And all the while, you could imagine there's armies and there's people all around the city attacking the city. And they make it to the fortress. And it says, that very night, this king, and not only this king, but the whole kingdom is taken down. So it's like that statue we remember from, from chapter 2. The gold head, boom, knocked off. Babylon is done. Who's left? Well, the silver kingdom. The, the Medes and the Persians, they're going to take over. And it says in chapter 6, we get this Persian king, this, this uh, Median king. Actually, he's a Mede. He's not a Persian. Um, but they're, they're kind of like two kingdoms that kind of formed. And they're one organization. Anyway, um, chapter 6 says that he was set over the kingdom and he got all these people together, these leaders to, to rule the kingdom for him. And one of them was Daniel. Obviously he was important to Nebuchadnezzar. He was important to Belshazzar. Now he's going to be important to Darius. And it says here that he became distinguished among all of them. Obviously Daniel is blessed by God and everything Daniel does, there's like success with because he's doing it for God. God helps him succeed because he's working hard and doing well. And it says all the people got jealous of Daniel. They wanted Daniel's reputation and they wanted to take him out. So they had to plot this scheme to get him out of power. How do they do that? Well, they make some law that is in regards to Daniel's prayer life, to his spiritual life. It says that they sign this document and they get the king to sign this document that you can't pray to anyone else other than the king for like a month. So they're like, okay, this will be great. We'll get Daniel. We'll catch Daniel. What will Daniel do? Will he hide and pray in secret? Or will he publicly and openly play, pray? Like, what is he going to do? We'll see. Chapter 6, verse 10. It says, When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went up to his house, where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Here's what Daniel said. I'm going to do exactly what I was doing before. I'm not going to change my pattern. I'm not going to close the windows. I'm not going to do this in secret. Like he did it in such this public way. Obviously it wasn't meant to show off to everybody. This is just what he always did. But the point was he wasn't going to change his pattern because these people wanted to make some law to say it was illegal to pray to the Lord. He was not changing his pattern. And it says after that, he gets caught. They try to, they put him in the lion's den. 
The king tries to save him. It's actually super interesting. Darius does not want his top guy. I mean, this is his top guy. He does not want him thrown to the lion's den. He's not even mad at Daniel. He's mad at the people who trapped Daniel. And he tries all he can to, to stop him. And, and, and he even says... He stayed up all night, said sleep fled from him. He said, may the God that you serve deliver you. Like he's, he's asking God to deliver Daniel. And says he stays up all night. He can't sleep. And it says at dawn, the king runs down to the lion's den. This is just such an interesting scene. What does it show? God is the God above all kings. He's the one who sets up kings, tears down kings. And it says, as he gets there in the morning light, he says, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lion's? Is God powerful enough? That's the question. And again, he's not asking with lack of faith. He's just asking, Daniel, are you okay? Are you alive? But the way that he puts it is so structured so that we see it's God versus everything else. Is God powerful enough? Well, the answer is, Daniel says, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel. He shut the mouth of the lions. I haven't been harmed because I've been blameless before God. I've done what he wants me to do and I've suffered no harm. Then, says the king was exceedingly glad, he commanded that Daniel was taken up out of the den, and Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. There is a connection here between his faith in God and his actual circumstances, which I think for a lot of us, we think, well, those two are totally separate. Like, there's no way your faith in God could have anything to do with the outcome of how things are going to go, which I recognize that sometimes in our world, things can go wrong for us, even though our faith is in God. But I want you to see that there's a connection between things going well and your faith being in God. Now, don't read that backwards. Don't say, if things are going well for me, then my faith must have been in God. And don't even say that every time my faith is in God, then things will obviously always go well for me. That's not what I'm saying. But what this is trying to show is there is a connection between the two that we like to separate completely. But there is a connection that obedience to God and serving him and being blessed by God, there's absolutely a connection. It says afterwards, it says, the king was so mad at the people that tried to trap Daniel. He took them and their counselors and their families and everyone who worked for them and he threw them in the lion's den. And it said before they hit the ground, before they were even able to hit the bottom of the lion's den, they were torn apart by these lions. And then what does Darius say? He breaks into song. We see this throughout the book of Daniel. What does he say? He says, for he, this is talking about God, is the living God. And he has an enduring kingdom that lasts forever that shall never be destroyed. His dominion shall never come to an end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. And he has saved Daniel by the power of the lions. And it says, so this Daniel reigned and prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. What is God doing? God is showing again that Daniel is favored because God is the God above all gods. Remember that. Whenever you're concerned or worried that maybe God's not able to deliver, or God's not able to save, or God's not able to protect. Remember, God is the God above all kingdoms and all gods. The book of Daniel is so clear about that. So let's look at the book of First John. First John chapter four is what we're looking at. Um, very famous chapter here. It's about the love of God, the love that God has for us and the love that we're supposed to have for others. But I want you to see there's something that sets all this up. It's First John four, one to six, which says, do not believe everything you hear about God. Don't believe every spirit. Don't believe every teaching about Jesus. He says, test the spirits. Make sure that you're using biblical discernment on whether or not you're listening to true teaching or false teaching. Well, how can we know? Well, it says the one who says that Jesus did not really come in the flesh, someone who denies that Jesus really lived a human, fully human life. Well, they're not from God. So that was the big false teaching that was happening there. We can take this and apply this further. I want you to be careful and discerning about what you hear about God. If what you hear about God is does not correspond with God's word, with the whole of what the Bible describes, well, then you're probably listening to false teaching. And he says here, be careful, test the spirits, make sure that what you're listening to is true and from God. So then he says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. So don't be afraid. Sometimes we're so afraid about false teaching. We think, well, we could never know. We could, I mean, I'm never, I'm not smart enough. I haven't studied enough. Well, just if you're from God, if you know God, you've overcome the world and God's going to give you the ability through understanding through his word to sort through what is true and false teaching. Then it leads into the section on love. He says, if you claim to know God, but you don't love, well, then you don't know God because God is love. And then he talks about what God did for us in love. It says, in this is the love of God made manifest. We see God's love in the world. How? That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, 
not that we have loved God. That's not what the love of God is. Not that we possess some love for God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The one who covers our sins through his atoning work on the cross. That is the love of God on display for us. How do we know that God loves us? Some people are like, well, my situations show that God clearly doesn't love me. God clearly doesn't care about me, right? I mean, think about Daniel, throwing the lion's den. Well, God clearly doesn't care about me. Well, God has displayed his love for you and that he sent his son to live and to die for you. So if you ever doubt the love of God and you're in Christ, look back to the cross. That's where you can find so much assurance that God loves his people. He loves you because he sent his son to live in your place and to die in your place. It says, if that's true, let us abide in him. It says the love of God is perfected. It's brought to a completion when God's people start living out the love of God. He doesn't just want to show love and then want us to live however we want to. He wants to show love to us and then have us turn around and show that love to other people. He says, no one's ever seen God, right? No one's ever seen God face to face, not even Moses. But God is shown, he's manifested when we keep his commandments and love others. That's how God's love is shown in the world, when we love our brothers. That's super cool that you can show the love of God in this world by putting others first, by not being selfish, by treating others well. You can show the love of God. So find some ways today to show the love of God to others. So thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for another daily Bible reading snapshot. Thank you.